All right, Nids Nerds, in this video we're going to talk about the antidiuretic hormone. So the antidiuretic hormone, where is it produced? It's actually uh, produced, or is actually say, secreted in the posterior pituitary, right? Because it's actually made by these neurons that are located within the hypothalamus. What are these neurons here located? What are they called? You know these neurons right here are actually called the supraoptic? So it's actually the nuclei that are located up here. The axons are coming down through that tract. But the supraoptic nucleus you know, nucleus is just a fancy word for saying a, a group of cell bodies in the CNS, central nervous system. So this is just a bundle of cell bodies right here, right? That's the nucleus. That's the, these are the guys that are actually synthesizing the ADH, but then they're storing it down here in these little vesicles in the posterior pituitary. But then whenever there's some type of stimulus, they send these action potentials down and release the antidiuretic hormone. What are those stimuli? Okay, there's mainly two different stimuli. So let's say, what are the two stimulus of ADH. Okay, let's, let's break this out. Let's say one over here, one stimulus is actually going to be our blood pressure. And I'll explain what I mean by the blood pressure. The other stimulus is actually going to be the plasma osmolality. Okay, these are the two stimuli here. Now, what does the blood pressure have to be to be a stimulus? Does it have to be low? Does it have to be high? It actually has to be low. So you need to have a low blood pressure in order to have this stimulus. How does this actually act as a stimulus? You know there's a hormone that's actually being produced whenever there's low BP? It's called angiotensin 2. Okay? Angiotensin 2. And we'll talk about that in the renin-angiotensin system. What does the plasma osmolality have to be? Well, usually if blood pressure is low, usually there's some type of reason that the blood volume is low, so there might not be as much water. So if there's very little water in our blood, then the blood is very hypertonic, which means it has a lot of solutes and very little water. When something's hypertonic, the plasma osmolality is said to be high. Okay? So again, what do we say is this person's problem? They're most likely having hypertonic blood. So their blood is very hypertonic. What does that mean when something is hypertonic? Well, it means that most likely your water volume or water volume concentration is low. Very little water in the blood. And it also means that you might have a lot of solutes in the blood. Okay, so like a lot of electrolytes and different types of uh, nutrient molecules in the blood, right? So the water to solute ratio is thrown off where there's very little water and more solutes. That's a problem because now ADH has to regulate that. So these two are the main stimuli. Okay, so how does it actually do it? How does the actual hypothalamus pick up this change in the plasma osmolality? I'm glad you asked. You see these puppies right there? These are the osmoreceptors. I love these guys. These are the osmoreceptors. You wanna know why I like them? Because their names make me feel smart, okay? You know what they're actually called? They call them the organum vasculosum of lamina terminalis. That's one of them. The other one is actually called the subfernicular organ. And these two guys are picking up this change in the actual blood, the, the tonicity of the blood, the concentration of the blood. What is it picking up? The water and the solutes. So if these guys are stimulated by what? High plasma osmolality, they're going to send signals to this supraoptic nucleus and stimulate the supraoptic nucleus to start releasing the antidiuretic hormone. Well, how does blood pressure stimulate it? You know there's receptors for angiotensin 2 up here? So let's say that here's a receptor here. Look at this. Receptor here for angiotensin 2. And angiotensin 2 comes in, and look what it does. It binds onto this receptor and send signals that stimulate the hypothalamus to, release, to send action potentials down and release the ADH. So now what is this ADH gonna freaking do? All right, so you see this cell right here? This cell is actually called a principal cell. So what is it called? It's called a principal cell. You know where it's actually located? It's located within the collecting duct. You know where the collecting duct is located? In the kidneys. So if I look here, what I'm looking at in this structure right here is I'm looking at a part of a nephron. So now, what's the component of the nephron right here? The nephron's actually made up of two chunks here. One is this tuft of capillaries called the glomerulus. The other chunk of it 
is this, you see this like little like U-shaped structure here? It's kind of wrapping around it. It's called a, it's called a Bowman's capsule. So the Bowman's capsule and the glomerulus make up the renal corpuscle, okay? So that makes up the renal corpuscle. This is the renal corpuscle. The other component of it is actually going to be the kidney tubules. What parts? So you see this little coiled part right there? That's the proximal convoluted tubule. You see this loop right here? That's the loop of Henle. And then if you come over here, you see this other coiled part right there? That's the distal convoluted tubule. This is what the nephron is, but we didn't talk about what we're looking at. This is the collecting duct. A lot of nephrons empty their actual filtrate into the collecting duct, but that's where ADH is focusing. So now let's go ahead and zoom in on the collecting duct. So what I did is, there's a whole bunch of cells that make up the collecting duct. I'm zooming in on one cell and seeing how ADH is functioning. So here on this um, membrane, ADH has a receptor. You know another name for ADH, it's called vasopressin. So vasopressin has receptors located here. If we were to be specific, this is actually a vasopressin type 2 receptor. Okay, so this is a vaso uh, vasopressin type 2 receptor. ADH comes in, and look what he does. He binds onto this receptor and triggers an intracellular cascade. How does he do that? So the first thing he does is he activates what's called a G protein. So he actually activates a G stimulatory protein. And this G stimulatory protein is normally, normally it's actually bound to GDP, which keeps it off. But then what happens is it's going to get bound to GTP, which turns it on. All right, he gets, he gets turned on from that, right? So then what happens? He starts moving along the membrane and he activates another enzyme. Look at this, this, this is a big enzyme. Look at this enzyme right here. This enzyme right here is called adenylate cyclase. And what that G stimulatory protein does is he binds into this adenylate cyclase and activates this adenylate cyclase. When he activates the adenylate cyclase, what he does is cleaves off a of phosphate and turns him back into GDP, which turns the G stimulatory protein off. But then he's not done. He sees ATP and he takes that ATP and converts that into cyclic AMP. This is our second messenger. What does cyclic AMP do? Cyclic AMP activates a very important protein here and this protein is called protein kinase A. So this is an extremely important protein because this protein is going to regulate a lot of activities inside of this cell. You know another signal that ADH gives with this G stimulatory protein? It also activates these protein kinases and activates two pathways. So let's see these two pathways. One of the pathways here, let's say I draw the nucleus of this cell and here's the DNA inside of the nucleus. Protein kinase is actually going to come over here and it's going to stimulate specific genes. And these genes are under, going to undergo transcription and translation. They're going to make some specific proteins that go to the rough endoplasmic reticulum and then into the Golgi and get packed into vesicles. So let's draw these vesicles here now. So let's say here's a vesicle. Let's actually draw it in black. Let's say here's our vesicle. And on this vesicle are some very important proteins. Let's draw these proteins here. Look at this one right here. These proteins right here is actually going to be aquaporins. So what are these proteins here called again? These orange proteins, they're called aquaporins. But I'm going to be very specific and I'm going to give these aquaporins a more, even more specific name. You know what these are called? These are actually called, those orange proteins are called aquaporin 2. They're actually called aquaporin type 2. Okay, why am I mentioning that? Why am I being so picky? Well, the reason why I'm being very, very picky is because there's also aquaporins over here on the basal lateral membrane. They're all over the place, and these, pro these proteins are always open. What are these black proteins that I'm drawing now? These are also aquaporins, but you know what type of aquaporins those are? These aquaporins are aquaporin three and four. So these black proteins that are located on the basal lateral membrane and are always open are called aquaporin 3 and 4. So these ones right there are called aquaporin 3 and 4. And so these were the black channels. These orange channels here are going to be the 
Aquaporin, two. That's why I'm being very specific. Because these channels are not here when ADH isn't there. These channels are only made when ADH is present. So normally, guess what's running through here? You know, we're making urine in our kidneys, right? So water is actually a very integral component of our urine. Water is actually flowing through here. And if there's no channels, it can't get taken in. It gets urinated out. But you know what else protein kinase A does? He's not done there. Look what else he does. He also stimulates by phosphorylation reactions, because you know that's what kinases do. They put phosphates onto things. So like, for example, if I were to show here, it might phosphorylate some transcription factor. Or it might phosphorylate certain proteins that migrate this guy towards the cell membrane. And look, it fuses. So now this protein is going to fuse with the cell membrane. So let's show that. So now let's actually show this guy fusing with the cell membrane. What is it going to look like now? So now look at this. Let's draw this part here, and let's draw all these orange proteins into the membrane. So let's draw one, aquaporin two, another aquaporin two, and another aquaporin two, okay? And then again, they're merged with the membrane, right? So this was the part of the vesicle. It fuses with the membrane. And now the water was just gonna get lost into the urine. But look what, look what happens with these aquaporins, because what did protein kinase A do? He stimulated the migration of these aquaporin twos into the membrane. Now look, this water's flowing by, but then these aquaporin twos open up. Water's like, oh, sweet, I'm getting in. Whoop, 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 and he runs right into the cell. So he gets taken out of the filtrate that we're gonna usually urinate out. He brings it into the cell, and then guess what else he does with it? He's like, okay, now I can actually move from the cell into the blood, because there's not as much water in the blood. So now this water that was brought into the cell through these aquaporin twos are actually gonna rush out of the cell. And when they rush out of the cell, they move into the blood. So now water is out here in the blood. What happens to the, the plasma volume now? It increases. So now the actual plasma volume goes up. If the plasma volume goes up, guess what else goes up? The blood pressure. And if the blood pressure goes up, what was the original, what was one of the stimuli? Low BP, what did we do? We brought it up. So we took care of that issue. What was the other problem? The other problem was that we didn't have enough water in the blood to contribute to the plasma osmolality. There was more solutes than there was uh, water. So it was hypertonic. When we bring this water into the blood, our ratio between the water and the salts are gonna be close to equal. You know what it's called whenever your salts and your water are pretty close to equal? So then look what happens to the plasma osmolality. It was up, but now the plasma osmolality is gonna go down. Plasma osmolality, osmolality goes down but it tries to approach a point of what's called isotonicity. So it tries to become isotonic. Okay, you want, in other words, you want the actual water in the blood to be almost equal to the solute. It's about 300 milliosmoles per liter. That's about the tonicity of what you want it to be. But we took care of the issue, didn't we? Our plasma osmolality is back down. Our blood pressure is back up. We fixed the issue. But ADH says, I can also do something else. You know he also has receptors on blood vessels when there's really, really high ADH concentration. You know, let's say there's actually some smooth muscle cells over here. And there's a receptor right here for the ADH on those smooth muscle cells. And what happens is, in any systemic blood vessel, it could be any systemic blood vessel, this ADH has another different type of receptor. Remember we can also call it vasopressin. The ones in the kidney were vasopressin uh, type 2. This is vasopressin type 1 receptor. And then what happens? What do we say the ADH can do? He can bind on to this actual vasopressin receptor. And he activates a specific uh, mechanism, a GQ mechanism, where he increases the calcium in those muscle cells and causes them to contract. If you contract the blood vessel, you, you decrease its diameter. So it's called vasoconstriction, right? So what's the overall result out of this? The overall result of this is vasoconstriction. And what does vasoconstriction do? Remember, it decreases the actual diameter, so it increases peripheral resistance. And what happens if you increase your peripheral resistance? You increase your blood pressure, okay? So that's another way that ADH can try to take care of this issue. Okay, 
real quick to end off this video, let's say what happens, just real quickly, what happens if we make too much ADH and what happens if we make very little ADH? So let's say what happens if we start off making very little. If you don't make enough ADH, so let's say that there, there is a condition in which you don't make enough ADH. I'm going to write this one down. It's called, so very little, so we'll say low ADH, hyposecretion. Usually this is due to like some type of trauma to the head. This condition is called diabetes insipidus. And again, it's usually due to some type of severe like hit or trauma to the head that damages certain areas inside the hypothalamus and the posterior pituitary. And it can't release ADH. If you can't release ADH, what's the job of ADH? To bring water into the blood. If you can't do that, what's going to happen? The water's going to get lost into the urine. You're going to be peeing like a mofo, all right? And when you're peeing so much, what's that called when you pee a lot? It's called polyuria. And if you have polyuria, you urinate a lot. If you start urinating a lot, you get really, really thirsty. That's called polydipsia. That's one way to determine if someone has diabetes insipidus. You actually taste their urine. You know, back in the day, they used to do that. They used to drink the urine to see if the urine was actually like sugary to determine if it was diabetes mellitus or if it was really, really bitter and watery. That could be diabetes insipidus, right? That's how they used to do it back in the day. Thank goodness we have other tests now. All right. What happens if you actually make too much ADH? So maybe there's a tumor. Maybe you have some type of tumor in the hypothalamus or tumor here in the posterior pituitary. Um, or maybe you were exposed to some type of bacteria that caused meningitis and it started damaging certain tissues and also can lead to ADH secretion. Whatever it might be, you're making too much ADH. What do we say ADH does? When it's present, it brings water out of the kidneys and into the actual blood. If you're doing that excessively, you're gonna hold on to a lot of water. You're gonna get puffy, all right? You don't want that. What's that condition called? It's called syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion. Why is that very dangerous? If you bring so much water into the blood, what's gonna happen to the ratio between your water and your solutes? Your water is gonna be greater than your solutes. Then what that happens is, is if you start overpowering the amount of solutes you have in the blood, specifically sodium and chlorine, that water, whenever there's less salt, water starts leaking out of our blood vessels because there's not enough salt to hold it inside of the blood. When it starts leaking out of the blood, it starts getting leaked into our brain and can cause cerebral edema, and that's very dangerous, right? So that's one condition that you have to be able to fix. So usually if they have cerebral edema, you can give them some type of mannitol to pull some of that water out of the brain, but it's extremely dangerous. So syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion is a very severe condition in which you produce too much ADH, all right? All right, Ninja Nerds, I hope all of this made sense. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Until next time, Ninja Nerds.